All right. So today's topic, we're going to talk about finding and converting buyer and seller leads. And then tomorrow, Patty's going to be here and she's going to talk a little bit about how, how do you nurture these folks? You know, when you capture these leads and get them into your database, how do you kind of build a relationship with them over time and get them to a point where they really turn into business for you? So that'll be tomorrow with Patty. But, you know, here's the thing. We did the tell me something good. This is what I would call Lake Database. And uh, actually, I stole this slide from one of our classes. This, every time I come across this slide, it reminds me of a heart. I don't know. That's just me. It looks like a heart to me. But here's the thing. If this is like database, the good news is there's lots of tributaries that feed this. There's leads everywhere, guys. And, and one of the things that I think we've got to think about in terms of lead generation and how do we find buyer leads and how do we find seller leads is we have to be open to finding leads where, wherever they show up. Right. And there's so many places. If you look here, there's open house visitors. There is um, people that find you on the on the web. There's responses to your advertising. There's geographic farming. There's getting involved in community events. There's even this uh, random conversations. You're going to be surprised how much business just comes from random conversations. Let me give you an example. I'm wearing right now. You probably can't see it too well, but you see I'm wearing my KW shirt. I can't tell you how many times when I wear this out. And I got a whole bunch of them, right? It, it's, it's, I've got like eight or 10 different of these golf shirts. This one happens to be a Nike shirt, by the way. And uh, you'd be surprised how many times when I go out and just have the KW on my shirt, people come up to me and start to ask me real estate questions. Do you know how much the house is down the corner around the, you know, whatever. And so it just happens. We've got to be open to the fact that it happens a lot and it happens anywhere. And um, so what are the, some of the sources? You know, if we think about lead generation, finding buyers and finding sellers, couple rules of thumb. When you are trying to attract sellers, what you want to do is you want to advertise and market your brand, right? Sellers are attracted to agent brands. When you want to try to find buyers, you advertise inventory because buyers are interested in what? Stuff to buy right? And so you kind of think about it this way. Am I trying to find a buyer or am I trying to find a seller? And let me ask you, who's more important in the, in the grand scheme of real estate? Who's more important, the buyer or the seller? Do you have any thoughts around that? Do you have an opinion one way or the other? I think they're equally as important. Okay. Equally without as important. A seller, you can't have a buyer and without a buyer, you can't sell a house. Okay. Well, Without a seller selling their house, there's no inventory. <laughs> well, there's no inventory right now. It's a little bit of a, a stupid question. It's a little bit of a trick question. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, if we're going to have any kind of a market, there has to be buyer demand, right? It doesn't matter. If there's not somebody who's willing to spend money, it doesn't matter what you've got, what your service is, what your product is, unless you can put yourself in the pathway who's, for somebody who's willing to pay for it. It really doesn't matter what you've got. So you need them both. And the game of, of any kind of, of real estate or, or any kind of market economy is how do I get in the pathway of people that want to spend money? Now, what we talk about is leads, listings, and leverage. Those are the three L's of real estate. Leads, listings, and leverage. It's not the three L's being location, location, location. You'll hear that. But it's leads, listings, and leverage. You got to have leads before anything else. And of all the kinds of leads... You know, listing leads are actually better for your business than buyer leads. And why is that? Because they give you leverage. What happens when you control the inventory is that the people who want to spend money will just come and find you. If you don't control the inventory, you have to go find them. And it just takes more time and it takes more money. And it works the same way in every kind of market there is, right? It works the same in the stock market. It works the same in the housing market. Whoever controls the inventory controls the market. Guys, it works the same way in the supermarket. Think about this for a minute. If I was Kellogg's and I'm making cornflakes, I can either control the point of access and make you go to the store to buy the cornflakes. Otherwise, I got to hire a whole team of door-to-door -door cornflake salesmen. And that just doesn't make sense. It's not efficient. So it's always about controlling the inventory. The listings are great because the buyers will come and find you if you need them. But we're trying to get in the pathway of people spending money. And that's the buyers. We need them both. And the traditional way we find buyer and seller leads is through our prospecting and through our marketing. 
right? And we'll do a deeper dive on, on both of these in, in another session. But when we're thinking about lead generation, don't forget that it's not just picking up the phone and calling people and prospecting. On the prospecting side, you have things that are more active. There are things that you control. There are things that you kind of are are being proactive to do. I think about prospecting the same way I think about like a gold rush prospector. You think about the image of, of the guy out in California kneeling by the, the side of the stream with his pan in the water, kind of sifting through the mud and the muck and the ick in the hopes of finding a little nugget of gold, right? He's getting wet, he's getting dirty. Prospecting is like that, you're getting your hands dirty. And on the prospecting side, when we're looking for buyers and sellers, we can do face-to-face -face prospecting, which would include things like talking to for sale by owners. It would include things like talking to people who tried to sell their home and had no luck and they, that listing expired. It can include things like circle prospecting. Anybody know what circle prospecting is? Circle prospecting would be this. You think about an event that happens, you put a little push pin on a map and you draw a circle around the radius of that pin and you talk to people inside the circle about what happened. It's, that's sort of a generic definition. So we could, what could happen that I would talk to people about? I could talk about a new listing, right? And I could draw a radius around a quarter of a mile or half a mile and let people know that that new listing has come on the market. And one of the things guys that we do know, and this has been researched a million times, do you ever notice that when one new listing comes on the market, it doesn't usually take long before you start to see maybe another one or two more in the same neighborhood? It's just a phenomenon that happens. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that people who are getting their house ready, thinking about putting their house on the market, when they see one come on in their neighborhood, they're like, well, I'm not going to let my buyers buy that house. I want them to buy my house. So they rush it right out there. And so when we, we have a new listing, a really well-known script is one where we pick up the phone and say, hey, I just want to let you know that your neighbor's house at 125 Main Street just came on the market two days ago. What we know is that one house comes on the market, usually two or three come on right behind it. And so I'm just curious, what are you thinking about moving? It's, it's that kind of a script. That's a circle prospecting script. Or one that I love is called the good news story script. When you have somebody who's had a closing, and they've closed recently and the house sold quickly and it sold for top dollar, which is like pretty much everything that's selling in our market right now. You can pick up the phone and you call people in that radius around that house and you have this conversation that says, hey, good news, right? Your neighbor just sold quickly for top dollar. Have you thought about selling your own house? That's just kind of a circle prospect. I heard a script recently that called the, uh, they called it the um, lottery ticket script where you call up folks and say, hey, did you know that you were sitting on a lottery ticket that was worth a fortune that hasn't been cashed? It's called your house. And I'm just curious, how much would your house have to be worth in order for you to think about selling it, right? You would be stunned how many people using that dopey script are finding people that are saying, you know what, if the, if the market is strong enough, I might think about moving and it gets you in the door to do a CMA, right? So prospecting, lots of different things, community outreach, getting involved in organizations, getting involved with builders and bankers and teaching opportunities, right? These are all things that we can do to get in the pathway. I, I love the idea of doing a, a home buyer seminar or a home selling seminar. And, and people look at me and go, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like public speaking. You're a freak. You do it all the time, all day, every day. Most of us would rather get run over by a dump truck than public speak. Quick show of hands, how many people would be, maybe not a dump truck, but we're not loving the public speaking idea, right? Well, you don't have to speak. You get other people that want to speak. You get a real estate attorney. You get a real estate inspector. You get your favorite mortgage guy or gal, and you bring them all together and let them speak for 15 minutes each. All you do is introduce people and coordinate getting people there through your marketing. And you've got a 45 minute seminar of people who are self-selecting in to learn about buying a house or learn about selling a house. That is a great way to get in the pathway of people that want to do business, right? So lots of different things we can do here. Door knocking on the marketing side, right? There's a million ways to market. You can market, I don't know, everybody know Rob? Big Rob who sells houses, NJ, you know who I'm talking about? On every billboard, every train, right? Rob, Rob Dukansky, Remax. 
um, had had an opportunity to uh, drive down South Jersey this weekend, and there was a spot on the turnpike where Rob's billboard was in your field of view three separate times on the same road. I don't know what that costs, but it costs a lot, right? You don't have to spend a lot, right? We can get involved in lots of different things, Facebook ads, lots of things. So, so the point is there's opportunities all over the place. If we start to think about what would I do from a prospecting standpoint? What would I do from a marketing standpoint? Now, here's the good news. If you're looking for buyers, 89% of the buyers who worked with an agent. This is from the National Association of Realtors survey in 2019, the profile of buyers and sellers. 89% of the buyers used an agent. That's really good news for us. 41% found their buyer through a referral. 75% re-interviewed only one person. Note to self, being first is really important. In fact, Gary Keller would tell you that being first is more important than being best. You can show up if you show up first and you make any kind of sense. The likelihood is no one is going to interview a second person. If you, if you get there second, if you get there third, the odds of you converting that buyer is really low. Getting there first matters. So we start to think about how would I get myself in the pathway of a buyer before they would start to go out and talk to other folks. You know, open houses, maybe they've met other folks, maybe they haven't. Home buyer seminars, frequently they're just starting out, right? There's lots of different things we can do. I want you to look at this though. This is a survey. This comes right from the, um, uh, this is the National Association of Realtors Survey 2020. And it looks at where did buyers find the agent that they hired? Who did they work with? Number one, a referral from a, friend, a family member or friend, 40%. Number two, I used the buyer that I worked with previously, 13%. So over half, they either already knew the agent or they were referred by somebody who they trusted, right? That's why we spend so much time talking about building your database and not feeling the need to go out and find new people all the time. Yes, we've got to build our database with new people, but the vast majority, over half, you already have them in your world. 6% of the population in the United States moves every year. Just take a look at the numbers of people that you've got contacts in your phone, multiply that 6%, and that's how many potential transactions are in your phone today. You already have plenty of relationships. The question is, do they know that you're in the business? Do you have, you know, will they use you, right? Once you get past the first two on this list, how did buyers find their agent? Number one was a referral from a family or friend. Number two was I used the same guy that or gal that I used before. Then it goes all the way down to single digits. Number three, I saw a property online and I contacted the person whose name was there. Number four, I just was generically on a website. Number five, I met an agent at an open house. Number six, I got referred by another agent, right? That's 5%. Number seven at 4%. The agent prospected me. They contacted me. Guys, 4% of the people that hired a real estate agent to help them buy a home hired the agent because the agent prospected them. The likelihood is they already have, you already have the relationship. Stick with your database first, right? Now, where else are buyer leads? Where else can we find buyer leads? Well, you know, you can find buyer leads on Facebook ads, right? Anybody familiar with any of the Facebook ads that we do here at Kevin Williams and how to do that? Qu quick show of hands. Who does not know anything about Facebook ads on Facebook? Uh, Facebook ads through Kevin Williams. Okay, let me quickly, quickly tell you. One of the things that you know is when you're looking for sellers, you advertise your brand. When you're looking for buyers, you advertise what? You advertise inventory. But hell, I don't have any of my own inventory. I know you don't need to. Do you have a website? Quick show of hands. Mm -hmm. Answer is yes, you do. I hope that you've set it up. In command, you can build your agent site. And on the agent site, the beauty is it has a feed of every multiple listing service in the United States. And so anybody on your website can search anywhere in the United States to find available inventory. And what you simply do is you decide, okay, what market am I looking to do my business in? 
right? We talked about that early on, I think, in, in this course is you got to kind of pick a lane. You can't be everything to everybody. You don't want to specialize in every market. Pick a market that you want to focus on. And if I decided that I want to focus in Westfield, which is where I live, then I would go to my website and I would do a search and say, show me all the homes available for sale in Westfield. Today, there's 55 of them. And that's okay. It's not super compelling, right? Can people find that kind of inventory on their own on the internet? Of course they can. But what could I do next? Well, the next thing that I might do is I might say, show me all the homes in Westfield that are for sale that have had a price reduction in the last seven days. Because the belief would be that if I'm in the market to buy a house, finding the ones that reduce their price would probably be interesting to me. And so with that, you do that search and that list of 55 goes down to whatever it is. Maybe it's five, maybe it's seven. And what happens now is that search result has its own URL address. It has its own web address. And that is a dynamic address that you can cut out and copy into an ad. And you run that ad through your Facebook command account. We can teach you how to do this. I can send you a video on how to do this. Anybody want this video on how to do this? I will send it to everyone registered tonight. Probably not till tomorrow, so don't look for it tonight. But tomorrow I'll send you a video. Lori Ballin, who's a great Keller Williams coach and a trainer, she'll show you exactly how to do this. You run an ad that says, find all the homes for sale that have had a price reduction. They click on that ad and what does it do? It captures their information and their telephone number and their name and their email address. Everything associated with their Facebook account is pulled into your command account as a new lead for you. And then it sends you a message to your smartphone through the Kelly app that says, hey, Hal, you just got a new lead. Somebody, somebody clicked on that ad. You've captured their information. You should go give them a quick call, right? That's the kind of lead generation that you can do. And here's the beauty. It doesn't cost much. If you were to do that kind of advertising on your own through your own Facebook business page, what we know is that real estate leads costs anywhere between 30 and $50 a lead. And you're like, well, you know, a lot of these leads don't turn out to much. I don't know if I can afford $50 a lead to do it that way. Well, you won't have to pay that when you go through your command account. Why? Because you're not using your own account. Your account is tied in to our command, to our Keller Williams advertising account. We've got 180,000 agents all using the same singular Facebook account which means that we spend about 200 to $300,000 a month on Facebook ads. You know what happens when you spend that kind of money with Facebook? You get preferential treatment. As a result, it costs us on average about a dollar and a half to $1.75 to generate the same lead that it would cost you 30, 40 or $50 to do on your own. I would say in the beginning, when you're trying to get in the pathway of a buyer, Think about setting up an ad like this in the target market that you want to do using your own website search results as bait. Put it out there for 10 days, set a $50 budget, and you're going to find you've got lots of folks to talk to, right? I would think that that's something that you can do. I'll send you a video on that so that you can learn how to do it, right? Home buyer seminars, we touched on those. Active for sale by owners can be a great source of buyer leads. Because here's what I know. Sometimes for sale by owners, their judgment isn't great. They think that they can sell it on their own for more money. And, and we know that they can probably sell it on their own. They just can't sell it for more money because we can create a bigger market than they can. And statistically, the research shows that a brokered property tends to net somewhere on the order of 14% more than the same property not run through a brokerage because of the marketing that we do, because of the urgency that we can create. So for sale by owners have sometimes some, some bad judgment, but here's the thing I've never heard a crazy for sale by owner say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sell my house because I want to become homeless and live under a bridge. I've never heard anybody say that. They usually sell their house with the intent of buying another one. And so one of the things that you can do is you can contact them for sale by owner and ask them, look, when you sell the house, where are you going? because I'd love to talk to you about possibly helping you find your next house, right? For sale by owners can be a great source. What else 
do you see people do to get in the pathway of buyers? Any ideas out there that you're seeing people do creatively? You guys are quiet. I'm not opposed to playing the game of points at someone on the screen. What else? Think about that for a minute. We'll come back to you. Same with seller leads. They're everywhere, right? Think about your database, right? Think about what we call the daily connections. In the Ignite class that I teach during the daytime, we have something that we call the 10-4. And what we're asking people to do is try to contact 10 new people every single day and have a real estate-related conversation. And if you have those kinds of connections, those kinds of contacts, invariably, you're going to find your way into appointments, right? Talk to people. Another one, number three, is open houses can be one of the very best sources of getting in the pathway of sellers is an open house, right? We know that a lot of times people that are going to open houses are, excuse me, are buyers. And sometimes their seller is just checking out the inventory, seeing what people are getting, seeing what neighborhood homes are worth so they can decide whether they want to get their house on the market themselves. And then agent to agent referrals, which is one of the best sources. And, um, you know, that's just another source. There's lots of different places that we can think of to get in the pathway of seller leads. If you look at the NAR study, again, what does the NAR say? 41% of the sellers hired the agent through a referral of a friend or a family member. 26% used the one that they used previously. That's two out of three already in your world in some shape or form. If we are in touch and nurturing that relationship and staying consistent and tomorrow, Patty's gonna go very deep into how to do that through command with what we call smart plans. We're gonna to touch on that here, but Patty's gonna go deep. And then after that, look, 5% found the agent through a website, 4% because the agent prospected them. Hands down, it's just the relationships that you already have, stay in touch, stay in touch, stay in touch. Let them know that you're in real estate. Ask them, who do they know, right? Um, I want to share a video here because I can tell you all kinds of stuff. I've got a really cool video here of some of the agents in our company talking a little bit about what they do for lead generation. I want to just spend a few minutes on this. And what I'm going to ask you to do is listen in and I'm going to stop this screen share and share another screen real quick. I want you to just kind of take some notes if you're in a, in a place where you can do that. And, and listen to some of the ideas of what people are doing to put themselves in the pathway of, of lead opportunities. We're going to get to conversion in a minute. But let me start with this screen share. Hold on for one moment here. Do you see this guy here who looks like he might have had a starring role in a Geico caveman commercial? All right, don't tell him I said that. But this is the video that we're going to watch. I've tried to optimize my screen here so that you can hear him well. Hopefully you will, and you won't have to turn your mic up too much, but let's listen to just a number of different folks talking about how they get in the pathway of buyers and sellers. Here we go. Lead generation is the first thing you should do. Make those calls. I took what I already knew and how I would go and shop for a house and just applied it to them. It's a numbers game, you know. If you can track how many people you're calling in a day and how many hours you're doing this, there's a formula. Make those calls. I used those things that I did innately to attract my clients. I became a hyper-local expert in the military because I am a military spouse. The two key things that I did to, to generate the most success uh, for me were social media and open houses um, because I didn't have the database like everybody else did. So I had to find ways that I could get in front of people fast and um, also something that would be maybe ha the buyer or seller would be ready and willing to buy now versus later. And I'm lead generating specifically in an area that is military friendly, military heavy. It really is in the follow-up. Be present in their lives, build a relationship. Uh, don't just ask for business every single time you see them. Be present in their lives, build the relationship. The least effective marketing activities for me were cold calling. And that's just because my niche market, they're not gonna be already local they're gonna be moving from other bases. Then I decided, well, if I'm gonna leverage cold calling, 
let's do it more purposeful and let's do it only in my niche market where I know that there's military there. They're likely to buy or sell in three to four years. Mindset was a huge part of my success. One of the things I tell myself uh, for an open house is one good lead every time. And so I start that action at least a week beforehand. I do a social media campaign. I follow up with all the likes and comments. And then I do a door knock around the, the open house. And then I uh, follow up with anybody who is um, active at the open house. And usually that results in at least one buyer or seller leads, usually more. So my first year, obviously, you know, the minute I made the change, it's super scary. I've got a network of people still reaching out to me to, um, you know, help them with what I was doing before, which was post-production. And I knew that my job in the beginning of the year, starting out, was changing people's mind from thinking, if they met somebody who needed a commercial made, they thought of me. I knew my job was to change all the people who knew and trusted me when they heard somebody needed to buy a house or sell their house, they thought of me. You know, if you're starting out and you don't have that network, be really intentional about where you spend your time go get gas you could meet somebody who needs to buy a house just think that way and you'll attract that to yourself i think everybody likes to talk about real estate your job is for people to know that you are in real estate and that they will bring it up open houses are by far just the best thing you should do out of the gate every weekend each day starting out i did door knocking i did mailing i didn't get a great return but i would totally i wouldn't i wouldn't change that if I was starting out again, I would door knock. Because just talking to people, getting rejected, uh, you know, it's great experience no matter what. Um, I'll also say that the most important thing is that your lead generation strategy is coming from a place of authenticity. You're not going to get every client in the city, but there are people out there that are going to resonate with who you are. Um, and just figure out a way to bring value. The income is secondary. That's how I go about it. And I think that really resonates with my, obviously with my set of people that I take care of. My lead generation strategies in the beginning were a challenge. Um, I actually honestly believed when I first started that lead generation was cold calling and door knocking. So I kind of stayed away from that. I was fearful, I was anxious. But over the course of the business, the things that were innate to me, uh, networking, open houses, facilitating classes, it allowed me the opportunity to connect. And I start to see that as opportunities for lead gen. And it was far more effective for me because it was natural. I, let me just go back. When I became a new agent from the time that I was in Ignite and graduated from Ignite in October, November, December, I closed with eight transactions in just three months. And during that period of time, I noticed a developmental gap. And, and I say this to say I was spurred to partner and collaborate with some other agents and create master classes as well as launch and learns monthly to share, um, you know, mindset, motivational speaking. And through this, I was able to build a community or I was able to build a group and a network broader than myself that basically helped others in home buying and also with other agents to help build their skill sets. It has put me and set me apart from other agents. Lead gen pitfalls that I've seen agents do are just being cookie cutter, looking at a successful agent or looking someone looking at someone else and doing exactly what they do doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Scripts gave me more confidence to to be able to know what to say when I was talking to certain clients. Also, there's different approaches to different questions that may be asked. So instead of looking at scripts as, oh, I have to memorize this verbatim, it was a resource to gain knowledge and, and definitely help me to build confidence, even though I was not planning on using it verbatim. I've always said my purpose is to empower and to elevate others to a level of excellence. And when I meet with my clients, I wanna make sure that they have enough information and they feel empowered to make the decision. How can I do that? How can I help you to make you feel that once we've made this connection, you are elevated? With my time blocking for the first two hours of every day, I would do lead generation. And sometimes it would be four hours if I wasn't getting the productivity that week that I wanted. Um, and then I followed up with all of my clients. Um, 
learn just lots of very successful habits through at night. I think that a lot of new agents want to try all different types of lead generation. You're not really honing any talent in one or two different lead generation. There's all kinds of different models, but they are not made for everybody. The best lead generation model for me was my sphere. I called my sphere every day. The number two way that I got business and did lead generations was open house. I found for me the best way to connect was to be in front of them. People I already knew um, that I had built a relationship with or I had met at an open house and I had time to actually connect with them. The scripts that the Ignite program provided for me really worked because they they helped me get out of my comfort zone when I was having to call everybody in my phone book and let them know that I had transitioned jobs, um, what I was doing, and it gave me the dialogue to ask on our team, we have picked six different nonprofits locally that we like. Um, and we do an event with all of those nonprofits every year. And we meet lots of new people that way. We invite all of our former clients, we invite um, our vendors, and then we invite the neighborhoods. We go door knocking for the event around the park doing it. Um, so then we also have client appreciation. We try to do that quarterly. We'll do a client appreciation event where we invite everybody out to a restaurant and then we provide appetizers and we just have fun. It's not necessarily a salesy event. It's just about having fun. By being out in the community, they see that we are knowledgeable about what we're doing, but we're also giving back. We care about where we live. My first year as a realtor, I tried just about everything in terms of prospecting and lead generation. What I found for me was that I present best when I'm face to face with somebody. So I really focused on um, open houses and then networking and getting out for coffees, uh, making myself visible in the community and uh, and then always making sure that I, I was able to speak to what was happening uh, in the market at any time. So keeping keeping up to date with local news and projects in and around town, uh, I found to be very helpful when when talking with people. To set myself apart from the many other agents out there, I've been utilizing video. And I find that putting the, the videos out on Facebook and a YouTube channel, and then even emailing them to clients really allows people to feel like they, they get to know you. And I've had experiences where I've talked to people on the phone and they were, especially with out of town investor clients, and they were not necessarily ready to go with me until I sent them a video saying hello, outlining how I can help them. It was good to have the phone call with them, etc. And the feedback I've gotten on the videos has been very, very strong. The biggest pitfalls I saw other agents having um, and, and even fell into myself with lead generation was not uh, having consistent follow up. So if I had an open house and I got some names and numbers and contacts and um, told them I'd be in touch with them, um, sometimes I would get overwhelmed and, and I wouldn't touch base with them in a timely, in a timely manner um, or to follow up on calls with somebody that has shown some interest, um, making sure that you stay on top of things and follow up with your, with your contacts is very important. Scripts are great for understanding what objections you might encounter and how to overcome those objections. What I discovered was I would learn what the foundation of the script was. What was it trying to get me to say? And then I would be able to, just by knowing that and, and, and having read it over and over and over, when I would have an objection come up, I was able to utilize those scripts, the content of the scripts in my own words. All right, there you have it. <clears throat> so um, one, two, three, four, five different people. That last guy that you just heard from, by the way, that's a gentleman from Austin, Texas named David Bain. He was the 2018 Keller Williams International Rookie of the Year. In his first year in real estate, uh, 87 closed transactions. Not a bad, not bad, right? Pretty good. But you heard a lot of different people talk about a lot of different things, right? We all think that in order to get in the pathway of buyers or sellers, we think it's always called calling. You heard a lot of people talking about how they approach this, uh, this, this game of how do I get in front of people and have these conversations? And so I'd love to have just about a couple minute discussion. What did you hear that you resonated with? Any of these folks say something that kind of struck you? Um, I, sorry, if, can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you. Okay. Um, what I really liked was um, basically doing things that come naturally to you. I think oh, sometimes man. we try to force ourselves to be something other than 
what we are naturally and what we're naturally good at because we're in a new role. But I think um, following your instincts and following what you're good at is really going to help you because you seem more authentic that way. And people just want to trust you, yeah, really, in my opinion. True. So true. And you know, there's a saying that we have that says, don't, don't compare your insides to somebody else's outsides, right? right? What does that mean? You know, it means just be yourself. We all think that somehow we've got to magically do And yeah, we got to learn some new things about real estate. We've got to learn some new lead generation techniques, guys. Have you heard the phrase, though, that the magic happens outside of your comfort zone? Have you yeah. heard that? Do you believe it's true? Yeah, probably. You, I think you have to push yourself a little bit. Yeah, you know what? And here's the thing that I'm going to tell you, Liz. It is true that you have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone to do more than you've done before. But make no mistake, the moment you push yourself out of your skill set, you're screwed. Right. You can't succeed outside of your skill set. What do you naturally do well? And how do you do that in a real estate related way? And then push yourself to do more of it than feels natural and comfortable. That's kind of the game. So one of the things that you heard, and I love that you heard that is, don't worry about, you know, just think about what do I naturally do well to, to meet new people and have conversations, right? What else did you hear anybody talk about? Anybody else? They all do something different. They all do what's different and right for them. One person's, you heard a lot of people comment on open houses, right? Open houses is a very, very good way to get in front of people in a very leveraged way. And guys, if you're dual career, frankly, you don't have time to do some of these things. You probably don't have the time and the bandwidth to kind of door knock as if you didn't have anything else to do during the day. When you're dual career and you have another job and you've got a family at home and you have a limited number of hours to, to work your magic, you've got to think as much leverage as you can, right? What's the most natural way? And you heard a lot of people talking about networking events and getting involved in things. You heard a lot of people talking about seminars and open house, all that stuff, right? And what else did you hear? Anything else? They all do different things. They talked the about, go ahead. The importance um, of following up with everyone. Of following up. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, Lisa. That is big. We're going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. I'm here to tell you that I really believe that for most agents, lead generation is not the biggest problem that they have in their business. Most people, it's lead follow-up. It's that they've got in the pathway of somebody who just wasn't the right time for them yet. And because they weren't ready to act quickly, we moved on and we lost track of them. Lead generation is a big thing. I'm going to tell you, I think lead follow-up is a bigger thing. Most of us lose more opportunities that if we didn't lose them would have been more than enough for us to hit our income goals, right? So many different things. What I want you to be leaning into with this video is what's right for you. What's your natural style? How do we get in front of folks in as leveraged way as possible and have real estate related conversations, right? Anything else before I get back into the PowerPoint? All right, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint. Here's what we do. Whatever lane we choose, and again, on that slide, a couple of slides back, we can do a lot of things from a prospecting standpoint, getting involved in activities, door knocking for sale by owner expires. We can do a lot of things in terms of marketing, so many different things that we could do. We've got to build this accountability cycle into our actions. You know, I, I think about when you're driving a car, you know, we need a feedback in terms of what are we doing, right? And so the manufacturers of the cars, they put these dashboards and on the dashboard, they put these gauges, right? Somebody unmute themselves and just give me an example of a gauge that you might find on the dashboard of your car. Check engine. Check engine. Well, that's a warning light in a gauge and hopefully we don't see that one often. <laughs> give me another one. The speedometer. Speedometer. Give me another one. You guys are all... The, the COVID, not driving much anymore is that the mileage issue? the mileage uh, the odometer right now here's the thing let's go with speedometer the speedometer is giving us feedback as to how fast we're going if i want to go faster there's nothing i can do to the speedometer that's going to make the car go faster if i want to make the car go faster what do i have to do hit the gas 
I got to step on the gas pedal. It's gauges and levers. I press the lever and then I read the feedback from the gauge to tell me if I'm going faster or not. And so if I'm driving and I'm in the, you know, merging lane on the highway and I've got to speed up, if I step on the gas and the car doesn't go faster, then what do I have to do? I've got to start to figure out what's going on. It didn't do what I expected it to do. Did I forget to start the car? Did I leave it in park? Did I forget to put it in gear? Do I have gas in the engine? Based on the lever that we press and the feedback that we get from the gauge, we have to make some evaluations in, is that what I expected? If not, what should I do differently? And it's, that's what accountability cycles look like, right? And for our business, what we do is we pick one of these lead generation levers something preferably that's in your comfort zone and your strength zone. And in a couple of weeks, uh, next week, maybe, or a couple of, I've got a session coming up here called um, how to lead generate playing within your strengths, your unique value proposition. That's coming up in a couple of sessions, but you set your goal, you take the action, you do that activity, and then you measure the results. What happened when I did this event, when I hosted this event, when I door knocked, when I called these people, what was the measurable outcome? And guys, here is the metric that we're measuring. Did it lead to a qualified appointment with a buyer or a seller, right? Was it Cheryl who said that she had an open house? She met somebody this weekend and it led to an appointment for the next weekend. That is the key metric in your real estate business. Are the actions that I'm taking leading to appointments? And we measure the results, we evaluate the process, and then we decide if I'm pressing this lever, but it's not leading to an appointment, then I got to start to evaluate how come. Did I pick the wrong lead generation lever? Am I doing something that isn't going to lead to appointments? Right? Maybe I picked the right thing. I'm just not good at it yet. Maybe I, I, I've, I'm calling for sell by owners. I just don't know what to say. It's a script issue. It's a practice issue. Maybe I pick the right lever and I do it well, but I just don't do enough of it. It's a volume issue, right? These are the things that we have to evaluate based on the actions, which means guys, we've got to pick the lead generation strategy and we've got to measure and keep track. If we don't do that, it's like, it's like flying an airplane through the fog without having an instrument panel. You have to be certified to fly as a pilot on instruments and not just on visuals, right? If you can't see, you can't fly unless you know how to read the gauges. In our business, it's the same way. If we're not keeping track, we're not, we're not getting the feedback that we need. So we pick a goal, we do the activity, we measure the results, we evaluate, we adjust, and then we go back and set that goal again. And what you will find, guys, is that certain things are going to start to pay off for you pretty consistently. You heard Jessica Dixon talk about focusing on military families. That's what worked in her wheelhouse. You heard Nikki Farrell say that she really started to think that lead generation was just picking up the phone and called calling strangers. And she was afraid to do that. So she started doing seminars. You had other people talk about open houses. You heard Aaron Cooper talk about doing community events and sponsoring events to support local charities as a way of meeting people and having real estate related conversations. When you keep track, what you're going to find is certain things consistently deliver for you and certain things don't. And so what we do is this. In the conversion process, we keep track. Every time we meet someone new who is somebody that we're putting in our database, we need to keep track of how did I meet you? Did I meet you through a door knocking exercise? Did I meet you by calling into my sphere and you were referred by a friend? Were you referred by an agent? Did you respond to a newsletter? All the different leads that we get, we need to source. Where did they come from? And once we've got all that listed out, then we're going to rank order from top to bottom, which was the highest source of leads down to the lowest source of leads. And then probably what we're going to do is take maybe the top four or five to focus on and just forget about the rest of them. If you look at this list, number one, social media, number two, door knocking, number three, sphere calls and newsletter and number five, open houses, you know, Fizbo's didn't really do so good. Forget them, don't do them. That's not your strength, right? Sort through this and you're gonna find four or five, really double down on your top two. 
get world-class practice, get really good at your top ones, continue to do, you know, maybe the top three or four, maybe five, and then just cut the rest of them off. It's kind of like when you're a gardener, sometimes in order to get a great bloom, you got to cut the sucker shoots off, right? If it's not going to, if it's not producing, get rid of it. You don't have time to put into things that don't deliver. So what we do, we pick a lane, we decide what can I naturally do that feels comfortable to me, that gets me in front of people and have these real estate related conversations. We keep track of where the leads come from. We prioritize and we focus. Now, here's the thing. This is the model. We get people into the top of our funnel through our lead generation activity. Then we've got to nurture them. And tomorrow, Patty's going to go through, how do you nurture these relationships over time? until they raise their hand to present an opportunity to us. That's tomorrow's topic. And she's going to teach you Tim Heil's approach. If you look at this guy, Tim is a KW agent out of Austin, Texas. Um, he was profiled in, a few years ago in uh, NAR as one of the top 30 agents in the United States under the age of 30 years old. When he was 27, he had businesses running in four different cities and closing hundreds of transactions a year. I will confess that guys like him annoy me. They're just overachievers and they make the rest of us look bad. But here's the thing, you know, what Tim said, and I've spoken to him about this, we brought Tim out to our Bergen Partners, uh, an event that we did before we went into lockdown. And I was talking to Tim about how he was so successful. And here's what he said. I stopped looking for leads that were going to do business with me right away. And I started to look for anyone who would be willing to let me stay in touch with them. If I can reach you in, a, in, a, in an event, or if I can meet you in a lead generation activity, and I can do something that creates enough value that you're willing to hear from me again, and I can put you in my database and follow up with you over time, at some point, you're going to need me. And if I can just be in your world at the time that you need me, there's a better chance you're going to pick me. If I can just get to nurture this relationship, that's more important in the long haul than finding somebody who's ready to do business today. That is something I just want you to really wrap your head around. Because yes, I need to find people to doing today business because I got to pay today's bills. But in the long haul, what we really want to do is just keep filling the funnel with people that you can talk to. And Patty's going to talk to you about that at length tomorrow. She's going to talk to you about how you do that with smart plans and even what frequency of contacts and how do you build it out? She's going to go into command and show you all that. Today, I'm just giving you the theory, okay? When you talk to people consistently and you nurture this relationship over time, what's going to happen is at some point, they're going to raise their hand and say, Kristen, I think I need to talk to you about selling my house. I'm ready to buy a house. At that point, we need to do some qualifying. And what does qualifying mean? It means having a conversation to figure out how close to right now are you ready to take action? You know, if you're ready, willing, and able to take action right now or within the next 30 days, we're going to classify you probably as a hot lead or an A lead or a number one lead. I don't care how you classify them, but you need a coding system for yourself that can differentiate which are the hot ones, which are the medium ones, and which are the cold ones. I had somebody, the God's honest truth, who chose to refer to her leads as Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. I don't care. If it works for you, you can call them whatever the hell you want. I don't care. But we need our hot leads to be followed up more closely, our medium leads to be followed up mid midstream. And that's probably somebody who's 30 to 90 days out, right? And our, and our um, people who are longer than 30 days out are sort of our C leads, we need to have a structured conversation to find out where are you on this ready, willing, and able scale. And how do we do that? We have conversations where we ask a lot of questions, right? Selling isn't telling. Selling is asking questions, the who, what, where, when, why questions. And we're going to give you some tools that will help you structure these conversations. These are what we call lead sheets. A lead sheet is a scripted conversation that has lots of questions pre-programmed on it. And if you're registered for, if you're in this class tonight, when I send you the email with Lori Ballin's video, I'm also going to send you a lead sheet, which you can use to frame out those conversations. And once we get past things like your name and address, 
we ask questions to buyers of everything that ranges from where are you moving to, right? Why is that important to you? How soon do you need to get there, right? How much are you thinking about spending, right? What's important to you in the home that you buy next? Lots of different things to start to get a sense of, is it time for us to meet right now? Or do I just need to nurture this a little bit longer and we'll meet later? We have a lead sheet for buyers. We have a pre-listing questionnaire for sellers that I'm gonna send you that helps you start to think about that conversation. One of the questions that I love for sellers, once you get past the basics of motivation, where are you going? Why is that important to you? What would do for you if you were there now? I love the question that's on the lead sheet that says, if we get your house sold within the next 30 days, would that create a problem for you? Right? Why is that question so good? What do you think? Why would you think that's a great question if you do? And if I sell your house within the next 30 days, does that create a problem for you? It shows like how motivated they are. You'd be surprised how many people say, wait, hold up. I, I'm not, I want to move, but I'm not ready to go that fast, right? I got stuff to do first. Or you're going to find people that say, you know what? I want to move. And that conceivably doesn't present a problem, except I don't know where I'm going. And, and I'm not sure if I want to sell my house until I'm really sure where I'm going to go next. And in a hot market like this one, that can create some real problems because the timing issue, right? So we've got to ask lots of different questions. I will send you these lead sheets that I want you to use and have them in front of you when you're talking to people. Don't be afraid to have them in front of you. Even if you're at an open house, take a clipboard and just have those questions queued up. Nobody cares. You don't have to feel like you have to memorize these things. If you have a lead sheet, it's going to guide you through to make sure you don't skip any. And you're going to make sure that you get all the information that you need. I recently went to a doctor and had a physical and two things came out of that. One was the doctor went through a whole series of questions that were programmed on the computer screen. The doctor read those questions right off the screen. I didn't think there was a bad doctor because they had a cue sheet, right? And then the other good thing that came out of that was I realized that I was a little bit overweight, which typically is not a good thing until the COVID vaccine starts opening up for fat guys like me. And now I'm eligible to get a shot because my body mass indication is between 25 and 30. Yay for me. It's the first time that my doctor said, you need to lose weight. I said, you take that back. I get a shot now, you idiot. Anyway, we have these tools. I want you to just look at them and use them. Just think about the questions that we're going to ask. And we need to qualify. Are you ready to go now? If not, when? And the nature of the follow-up that Patty's going to teach you tomorrow is going to be predicated on how close to taking action are you, right? Here's the thing, we think about our sales pipeline and all the people that become opportunities that are in our database, they raise their hand and suddenly they become an opportunity for us. We need to nurture them along. And so we call it a sales pipeline and, and there's different stages. It almost looks like a funnel. At the top of the funnel, there's just a general awareness. They're not really ready to do anything. They're just curious. And you can meet people like that at open houses. You can get people to click on your ads on Facebook who aren't really that interested in buying or selling a house, but they're just kind of liking the pictures that they see. They saw something really cool in the picture of the kitchen in your ad and they wanted to look at it more closely. Those are top of the funnel leads. There's no such thing, guys, as a bad lead. Just take that notion right out of your head. There's just leads that aren't ready to go right now because we know that the cyclical nature of real estate, they will buy and sell at some point. The next level in the funnel is they actually have interest and now they're starting to be a little bit more purposeful. They're starting to learn more. This is where you're gonna find people who are going to the seminars. This for sure is where you're gonna find people who are going to the open houses. And then at some point they're ready to go. They're ready to make a decision on who they're gonna hire and they take action. And the purpose of a pipeline is this, our sales pipeline is how do we move you through that process and build momentum, right? If you think about a, a pipeline, what's a pipeline? It's, a, it's almost, a, it's an object that things get transported through, right? If I was building an oil refinery and the oil was up in Alaska and I have the refinery in the Gulf of Mexico, I got to build this pipeline to bring the oil through, it's moving. And so I've got to find a way to get you to commit to the next step in the process. If we're not ready to meet yet, if you're not ready to take action yet, 
what's the next thing that you do need to do before you get a little bit closer to becoming an active buyer? Well, maybe I need to get my credit in order. Maybe I need to uh, get closer to the termination of my lease. If I'm getting a little bit further in the pipeline to become a seller, what are the things I need to do? Maybe I need to start getting rid of stuff and decluttering. I'm not ready to list my house yet, but I got stuff to do. There's this adage in sales that we say, ABC, always be closing. Has anybody heard that? Always be closing, right? Anybody watch the movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? Always be closing, right? Coffee is for closers, he says. This is the, uh, who was the actor in that? guy who played Donald Trump on Saturday Night Live. Who's the actor who was in Glenn Gary? Alec, 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 Alec Baldwin, right? He's having this sales contest in his office. He's got this office of real estate salespeople. And here's his, his sales office contest. First prize, whoever gets the most leads wins a Cadillac Eldorado. Second prize, you get a set of steak knives. Third prize, you're freaking fired, don't come back. That's the way it was. Always be closing. Coffee is for closers. I'm going to tell you that's BS. Always be closing is BS. Don't believe it. Now, when I say BS, I, I, I'm not saying what you're thinking. I'm keeping this PG-13 here. It's not, it's bad strategy. It's a beginner's script. It's, it's just, it's bad scripting. You're not always closing for the appointment. The reason why people don't like pushy salespeople is because they're pushy. We only close when it's time to meet. It's like being on a first date. Think about this for a second. You're having a really good first date. What's the natural thing that you would do? Is it to ask to get married? I hope not, because that is freaky as hell. Nobody likes that. The nice the thing that you would do after a first date is maybe ask for a second date. That's what a normal person would do. And so what would a normal person do depending on where they are in this stage to move a little bit closer, to move a little bit closer? And we need to get them to commit to taking that next step. We close for the commitment of time, but what we cultivate by asking people to do another thing. We never get off the phone with somebody. We never leave an interaction with somebody who we see as a lead without asking them to commit to what's the next step and then setting up a time to come back and check in. You know what, Mr. and Mrs. Potential Seller? Sounds like it's gonna be a year before you get your house ready to go on the market. I have an article that I could send you that talks about all the things that you can do to prepare your house with little minor home improvement items that you could do over time to maximize the resale. I'm going to, I'd love to send that to you. Would you take a look at that for me? Right. That's a, that's a, that's a low commitment. That's not a big commitment. And every time we finish a conversation, we, we ask them to do the next thing. And then when we follow up, we check in. Hey, did you get a chance to read that article that I sent you? If you did, terrific. What do you think? What's the next step, right? Maybe we need to start getting rid of stuff. You know what? Let me talk to you a little bit about how you can sell stuff on, on Facebook Marketplace. It's amazing what you can sell on Facebook Marketplace. You point your camera at it. You take a picture on it. You say $15. And within 10 minutes, somebody's buzzing your phone and they're coming and buying your stuff. It's amazing why don't we start that process and I'll check in and see in two weeks how it goes. We're just always getting this constant connection. What's the next step? What's the next step? When we do that, we move people through the pipeline. We're staying close to them and we're building a relationship with them. So when the time comes that it's time to really convert and meet them, you're not a stranger anymore. You've been talking to them all along. Yes, we do need to get in the pathway right out of the gate with people who are looking to buy and sell quickly. That's why we do leverage things. That's why we do very specific things that people can self-select in, like coming to my seminar, coming to my open house, responding to my particular kind of advertising that I think would be attractive to a buyer rather than just a tire kicker. But guys, we close for the commitment of time. We nurture people through the pipeline. And Patty's going to show you tomorrow how to do this through the command account. We call this opportunities where we actually walk them through. She's going to show you where to keep the notes, to keep records on all of this. And then we close for the appointment, right? When they're ready to meet and take action, we close for the buyer's consultation and we get them to sign the buyer's agency agreement. 
What's the buyer's agency agreement? It's the contract that we use to represent them exclusively. And um, we can do we can do we can talk a lot about that if you want to in future classes on how to bring enough value to the table that people are willing to work exclusively with you, and not just work with anybody, right? We close for the buyer's agreement, we close for the listing agreement, but here's the model, guys. There's a million different ways to get in the pathway of people that want to list and that want to buy if we get proactive, if we get out there. It's not gonna come and just knock on your door and come bite you in the fanny. We gotta go find it. And there's a million ways that we can do that. Advertising, marketing, seminars, direct mail, a lot of things. Whatever we choose to invest our time in, for you guys more than anyone else, think leverage first. Because you don't have unlimited time, think things that I can meet a lot of people all at once, as opposed to people where I'm going to meet people one at a time. That's going to really pay off for you guys. And keep track. And keep track of those lead sources and start to call out the ones that aren't delivering. This is how we do it. And when we do it this way, you're going to find you start to develop a routine. You start to develop a rhythm. But this is the way that it works, right? What questions do you have about anything that we're talking about? We're going to, we're going to start to wrap up for tonight. What questions do you have about this process or anything that you heard tonight? Anybody? Any comments? Any takeaways? Any ahas? Any funny jokes? I have a question about the coal radius search, like how you can do that. The Coles radius search or the cold call radius search, or did you specifically want to know about using the Coles directory? The directory, like the cold directory. Okay, um, so here's what the cold directory is for those of you that don't know. Coles is a company that creates a telephone directory, if you will, specifically for real estate agents. And it's a way that you can get telephone numbers. Now it's a paid subscription service. Some of your market centers have access to it. Some of them don't. But what Coles does is they go out and they plot every single residential property on a grid, on a map. And then they go out and they buy data and they try to match up who lives at this address, what's their telephone number, what's their email address. And they try to back and fill as much data as they can so that when you do your radius search and you decide I've taken a new listing. I want to do a, 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 a radius call, a circle call to let people know about that listing using that script. Oh, and by the way, you heard all of those people in that video talk about knowing what to say, the importance of scripting, right? But what you do is you put, you, you put the address in as to where that event happened. And in the Coles directory, you can then start to do a search at one tenth of a mile radius, a quarter of a mile radius, a half a mile radius, and you can just expand it all the way out to a one mile radius. And when you hit search, it will populate a list with the names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, cell phone numbers, everything they can find of everybody inside the circle and whatever diameter you set. Then you can download that list. It will also tell you who's on the do not call list and who is on the you can call list to keep you out of real estate jail. I don't want you calling people if they're on the do not call list. And the truth is most of us are on the do not call list. And so you need a system like this so that you can do a radius search and come up with like 2000 names on the list so you can find 150 that you can call. And that's a service, Coles Directory is the service. Now it's not necessarily the cheapest thing in the world. If you were to buy an individual account that can do that kind of searching in your target market, and the directory that you would use is what we call the Newark directory. It's not just the city of Newark, it's basically North Jersey. But that costs you about $1,200 a year, $1,000 a year. And a lot of times people are like, that's real money. It is. But if you start thinking about how you would use it, if you are going to really try to find a way to get in front of these names, that's, that's $100 a month. It's $25 a week. It's $5 a business day. If you think about the value of your time, it might be an investment worth making. And if you did this, not that I'm telling you to do this because I'm not going to tell you to do this, but if like Kristen and Lisa and Ann and Julia, if like five of you got together or six of you got together and one of you registered and you kind of shared the password, shh, I didn't tell you to do this. But if you kind of shared the password with each other and you took turns using it, 
and you said, I'll pay you $200 and sickness will pay you $200. Now we've covered the whole thing. Now 200 becomes pretty manageable over the course of a year. I didn't tell you to do that. Are we good? Okay, yeah. we're good. Um, but that could be something that you could do. Guys, I, was, I will tell you this and I'll get your question in a second. Ed. The thing you got to be real clear on when you're spending money in the beginning, of all the things that you could spend your money on, marketing, prospecting, spend your money on the thing that buys you the most access to people. If I only had $100 a month to spend, I would not spend it on anything other than a service that allowed me to get access to names because that's more important than a single mailing piece. That's more important than a billboard, whatever. Try to buy leverage in the beginning and then do the prospecting with it. What were you gonna say before, Ann? Um, I was gonna actually ask, are you allowed to add the people to your database that's on that or is it not kosher because it's only one-way communication? Well, you can put people in your database and, and we call those leads in your KW database. Leads are people that you have legitimate information. You know who they are, you know where they are. It's just that they haven't really responded back to you. And maybe you put them into your command account because you met them at an open house and they're just not following up with you, but you're still sending them stuff. Yeah. And maybe you put them into your command account because they live in the geographic footprint of an area that you're trying to break into. Yeah they're still, they're not unresponding, right? We've got to make sure we give them the option to unsubscribe. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that was okay and not like against some law. That you, can't, you, you just have to be careful. If they're on the do not call list, you can't call them. Yes. And there yeah. is kind of a can spam law that says you just can't blast emails out or blast bulk texts out with these services, right? That you can't be spammy. So what I would do is I would probably put the people into my command account that were on the I can call list and then reach out to them and try to prospect them and then have a way of kind of creating some value for them so that just like Tim Heil, they say, you know what, I don't really need you right now, but I'm willing to hear from you again because you haven't annoyed me too much, right? I'd start that way. So technically, actually, if you paid for that list you now purchase that information. So yeah, it's just, just you got to be careful. You, with, use it. you just be careful how you use it. For example, all the emails that you guys get from me that come with the KW sort of branding on it, that's through a paid subscription service that I have. It's a company called BombBomb. It's a CRM and they it's built really to send videos. I don't always send videos with it. But one of the things that I have to click the box before I can send a blast email to all 1500 of you guys to announce something is I have to acknowledge that I have a relationship with you and I'm not, this is not a purchase list, right? And, and because what happens is these email distributors, they get flagged by Gmail and, and places like that if they start to become too spammy. And, and so you don't, you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna just purchase a list and just start blasting people. You want to you wanna be purposeful and reach out to them and start to try to build a relationship. So anyway, what other questions do you have? I'll add to that. <laughs> okay. So I was in the process, long story, no, you guys will never be caught up to speed with. Anyway, I looked up um, a home. And it was late one night because I don't sleep and I was catching up on things I needed to do and that house hunting was one of them. So I clicked on, I guess, contact agent, like immediately at like 1 a.m. <laughs> my phone just went off, text messages, emails. I must have had 30 people contacting me both ways. I was so annoyed. <laughs> yeah. So the one young lady um, just, you know, introduced herself in an email whenever you're ready if I can be of any help let me know well here we are you know two months later I reached out to her because she was the only one that didn't annoy me yeah you know what being annoying is not a good business model it really isn't right and so you got to really start thinking about okay when Patty starts talking about these touch campaigns that we build in with a combination of texts and a combination of emails and a combination of phone calls we got to be cognizant of the quality of the relationship that I've got. 
if I don't really know you yet, or I don't know you well, I, I can't start to become super pushy and super assuming all kinds of things. I got to start being a little bit more tentative, a little bit more, hey, not sure if this is for you, but I just wanted to follow up and see, right? There's a lot of different ways we have to kind of do that so that it's not just like we're, we're all over people. Always be closing equals BS. It is. It's just a bad strategy. Building a relationship is a good strategy, right? All right, guys, I'm going to park the bus here. It's 7.15. Patty's going to go through how now. Today was the first level overview on, let's think about this. Lots of different levels we can do. Pick a lane, measure your results, find what's getting people into your world, and then start to nurture those relationships until they're ready to use you, and then follow them through the pipeline. Patty's going to go through in depth tomorrow on the details of nurture, how, to, how that looks. All right. Any okay. other questions before we call it quits for tonight? No, thank you. This is great thank as you. usual. Thank Have you. Have yourself a great night, guys. You're and I will talk to you real soon. Thank you all. Well. Bye. See ya.